Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 136 of the American Muslim Experience, and I'm joined by our co-host, Omar Ansari. Assalamu alaikum, Perez. Assalamu alaikum, listeners. It's good to be here. And and by here, we are in Chicago, for one. That's right. I was going to say, Perez, thanks for hosting me in uh, one of your hometowns. You got you have a, a number of hometowns, but I uh, appreciate you having me and uh, and to your mom, Asma Khala, for hosting me here. My mom loves to host, and she definitely loves to host you. So Of course. No, um, no formality is really between us. And we've been teasing this for a while, and I, I couldn't think of a more auspicious venue and auspicious guest to uh, inaugurate our Chicago recordings then with uh, Sheikh Mohammed Amin Khulwadia, who we are honored to be sitting here at Dar al Qasim at the lovely campus. Of course, there's another campus and we'll get to that, but we're here in Glen Ellen, Illinois, and it's a beautiful facility. For those of you who are local, you should definitely come and check it out, uh, attend some of the programming here. But a little bit about Sheikh Amin before we go right into the conversation. Sheikh Amin is a Muslim scholar, mentor, founder of Dar al Qasim an institute of traditional Islamic higher learning. Sheikh Lamin has an extensive biography, which I hope to sort of unpack uh, during the course of the conversation and discussion today, so I'll save that for that. Uh, Sheikh Lamin is someone who I consider to be a personal mentor, a personal advisor, my sheikh, Morabbi, and I am deeply grateful to Sheikh Amin and the guidance he has bestowed on me and the way he has shepherded me. So a lot of that I owe to the guidance of Sheikh Amin. Sheikh Amin, without further ado, welcome to Diffuse Congruence. Well, thank you very much for hosting me. It's an honor, pleasure uh, to talk to you always. And we're double honored. Uh, Omar is also here, so hopefully you'll be an entertainer now. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, this is our first time meeting, although I've heard your name for mm. decade plus yes. uh, through Berbez, some students who had moved to the Bay Area where I'm from and have come back here, uh, friends of mine in San Diego and so forth. Yeah. So if we, honored Good. to finally meet you. So Sheikh Amin, as we like to often do, love for you to tell us about sort of your background, where you uh, are from originally, and then from there we can sort of get into a deeper conversation around your family background and some of your early studies. Yes, uh, alhamdulillah. I, I was born in uh, Gujarat, India. My father had migrated to England when I was a year old and then he called us over two years later. So I was basically raised in England, Gloucester, England. I grew up there, went to school and, you know, it was a kind of provincial town anyway, Gloucester. It's, um, it's situated in the West Country, as they call it, in the Cotswolds, or hilly, beautiful, scenic, and um, conservative. Okay. With values and all of that. Uh, um, the schooling was good in the sense that I got into a grammar school. So that was the first thing that happened to me in terms of my education. And then as um, you know, I, I, I grew into understanding just a little bit about the British culture and I, I felt there was something missing. The, the, some, there was a vacuum kind of thing, it was very shallow talking to the, you know, the school friends and people who were there around us. I felt that there's something missing in this culture and obviously I was exposed to Islam through my father and through talks by other mashayikh who came from India, Pakistan. Okay. Although I understood very little, they spoke in Urdu and, you know, I didn't know Urdu at that time, but it was just the vibes, okay, the, the vibes they give off of the, the, this confidence that mm -hmm. Muslims are good and Muslims should learn Islam, especially in the West, so they can manage their lives uh, according to Islam and not kind of succumb to the British culture, environment and values, basically. So that kind of appealed to me. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I, I decided, not necessarily through my father, although he did support me, that I should go and learn Islam, you know, properly as a part of the schooling. Yeah, that's why I decided to go to go to, go to India. So, was your father, you know, Maulana Musa Khulwadia? He was a teacher in England. Yes, he was a teacher for okay. the whole community. He was okay. the first Imam, and um, he's well known throughout the country, much more well respected, and so on. He was influential in bringing so many mashayikh 
of Dilben to Gloucester because he studied at Dilben himself and he knew most of the Moshaikh himself firsthand. Yeah, so that was definitely an influence. Yeah, so it, it was good to see that other people respected him. During his tenure, who, who were some of the notable, uh, you know, ulama who were at Deoband at that time when your father was there? When my father was there, there was yeah. Maulana Hussein Ahmad Badani. Yeah, yeah, he was his student. He studied uh, Bukhari with him. Uh, he Jaza in Bukhari from him. Okay. Alhamdulillah. And there are so many other scholars, Allah Baliawi, Maulana Ibrahim, uh, Bihari, yeah. and the greatest, obviously, Qari Tayyab Sahib, Rahimullah who was the principal of the school, and he was just a phenomenal scholar. I've never met anybody like him. And you did meet him? I did meet him. I stayed with him. I was in his company. Alhamdulillah. He has the most intellectual, quote-unquote, influence on me. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Yeah, and we'll get to that. Um, I, so were you sort of the, I'm sorry, yeah. were, were you sort of the um, understood like, or was there expectations for you to be the heir apparent in terms of inheriting the uh, pursuit of scholarship from your father? Or you had, I, I imagine you had other siblings? Uh, we have siblings. Okay, I have okay. Siblings, yeah. How many and where, where do you rank? In, in I'm number three in the family. And so I have two sisters, elder, and I have other brothers, brothers okay. who are younger and one right. youngest sister. So, Alhamdulillah, was it that yeah. they had expectations? They definitely had expectations, mm -hmm. mashallah. Always making dua for me, and uh, alhamdulillah, it worked out well. Yeah. Uh, Prabhupada was telling me, you know, that you were, grew up in the UK. So I'm curious, just a little more before we even talk about your studies, just what that experience was like. Because um, we're talking about 1960s yeah. probably, right? 60s, early 70s, England. Probably so, not as much diversity mm. as there is obviously today. Not as much, not as strong as the Muslim presence. No, not, so no nowhere near it. Yeah. Nowhere near it. I we were living basically, um, you know, in a, almost a vacuum. Basically. Very few Muslims. We did have a local masjid, uh, mashallah, alhamdulillah, but... Um, you know, it it was the early days of Muslims in Britain, so there was a lot of um, antagonism, but it wasn't that visible on the streets. It, it, it's okay, you might get the odd shout, you know, from the other side of the street, you know, go back home or something. But on the whole, people were a bit more tolerant, I mm -hmm. think, in those days. Because as I say, it was a provincial town, mm -hmm. there wasn't much going on uh, in the town city itself. People wanted a comfortable life, relaxing on Saturday and, you know, reading the Sunday Times on Sunday. <laughs> right. So basically that was kind of lifestyle, very easygoing, yeah. slow pace. But a lot of Muslims around you, or were you like the only one growing up? No, we, 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 we had a little bit of concentration, not as much as now. Mm -hmm. um, but we were, you know, fairly okay. I mean, we, this was fairly safe. We didn't have any restaurants, and we, you had to do your own cooking at home. And, uh, you know, finding halal meat became slowly available uh, as more Muslims came in and we, we started to go to slaughterhouses and, you know, do our own zabiha. Uh, I mean, there was always groceries from India and Pakistan that came in. So that wasn't an issue. So I think life was okay. It, it, it was easy. Nothing too complicated. In terms of the um, the uh, demographics of the community, much has been written about the sort of variate the the differences that 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 are that that end up occurring with regards to the immigration of uh, Muslim immigrants, specifically to Europe versus the United States. Yeah. As someone who now has obviously lived extensively in both, uh, could you maybe speak a little bit to that uh, in terms of the demographics of the Muslim community there versus the United States here? Yeah. What happened is that, you know, after the Second World War, uh, Britain, like many European countries, lost a lot of labor because all the soldiers died. <laughs> and there weren't too many babies coming up either. <laughs> so they opened the doors for immigration. You could just walk into England. Okay. Mm. And basically, you'd be guaranteed a job somewhere in a mill, a factory, or just odd jobs here and there. So it was easy to come inside, which made it easier for the community to grow and become concentrated and that so on. But as far as demographics, you would pick and choose the uh, city based on your, 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 you know, 
your relatives, where your relatives live. So our relatives are all in Gloucester, so we all came to Gloucester, basically. Right. And likewise with the uh, Bengalis, with the Pakistanis, uh, even with the Arab, they only moved into areas where they had their own demographic people. So Correct. we had a very heavy, uh, heavy concentration of Gujaratis. Mm. And that's how we grew up, basically. Yeah. Likewise, other towns would have Pakistanis, others would have, you know, what do you call it, uh, Bangladeshis and yeah. so on. But that's how we became so concentrated in so many different areas. And then the you also talked about the sort of shortage of labor that occurs after World War II, yeah. that I would imagine then, again, speaking of demographics, uh, a lot of the vast majority, perhaps, of the immigrants were or they, labor they class. They were either farmers, yeah. or they were definitely from the working class, I would say 90%, maybe 95%. Right. We didn't have too many uh, educated Muslims from the overseas, right. whatever education there was, was with the people who grew up there. They were right. in school and, yeah. and so on. But the parents, they weren't educated mm -hmm. on the whole. And there were a few people, obviously. but So it, it was a bit of a struggle initially because you, you only spoke your mother tongue at home. And the parents couldn't converse in English. They didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> so that became a challenge because in school you're supposed to speak English, uh, but you can't translate because you're only used to the Gujarati words and how, how you do this. So uh, that's where I think the, the, the uh, KG and the infant school was very valuable for, for everybody. Okay. And as you got into high school, then it was easier. The transition was easier. <laughs> But uh, the, some challenges were there, definitely. Okay. Uh, Question, you mentioned that uh, it was a conservative environment. Kind of just comparing that to, you know, the world today. Did that just make things a little easier in terms of some congruency between Islamic values and the local values? Oh, definitely. Uh, they were in the 60s uh, and the 70s, and that's when I grew up, just end of 60s, early 70s. Uh, you, you could go to school and say, I want halal meals. The hmm. school would provide you halal meals hmm. because they're just open about it. And if you say that, Ma, I don't want my child doing religious studies, say, okay, no problem, go and sit in a library. <laughs> We're not going to argue with you. Right? Hmm. And if you didn't want to go to a Christmas party, say, uh, don't, don't come. We'll send you the dessert later or something. So it was easier in, in the sense of conservative values. In the school I went to, if, if um, you know a student didn't cut his hair, yeah. he would be caned. Right. Literally, of course. yeah, but that's gone now. Obviously, yeah. so then by the uh, end of the seventies, you could do basically what you want. So the transition w was incredibly fast. Within right. ten years, the whole environment changed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. As volatile as the sixties was, we're not living in times that are that different today. Yeah. What we've seen in the last ten years. Yeah. yeah. Um, so like Omar said, I mean, I guess transitioning into then your studies, at what age do you go to? Uh, I went at the age of 16, okay. alhamdulillah. Is that generally when people go to the Darul Well, what happens, oh. in, in England, the high school finishes at 16. Okay. And you go to a two-year college, and then you go and do whatever apprenticeship or further studies you want to. Mm -hmm. Uh, but we start earlier, we start a year earlier there than here in terms of the KG. Um, um, so that's when I went at 16. And you go straight to Darulum? Straight to uh, Madrasa in Gujarat. Okay. Uh, the way things are done over there, that you, you go to smaller schools for the early years. Okay. So I went to a school that uh, specialized in hips. Okay. All they did was basically hips. And are uh, they meant to be preparatory? Yes. Yeah, okay. Oh, definitely. Okay. And they really work. They're very efficient. Okay. Because then you're not distracted by all the other things that higher, higher level students do. You're not distracted by them either. <laughs> yeah. Right. So you just focus just full time hips. <laughs> okay. yeah, concentrated. Um, you wake up seven in the morning. You don't sleep after Fajr. So you start seven in the morning and you, you get four hours straight into the, the hips, memorizing. After Zuhar, you have another two hours. And after Asa, there's a break. And after Maghrib, you start preparing for the next day. Mm. 
There's no mid-afternoon nap or something like there bad, is. Oh no, you, you need the afternoon yeah. nap. You can't yeah. function. So uh, by nasa or maghrib, like no, no, typically? between um, oh. uh, yeah, between your your break and zohar. I see. Okay. Yeah. So we we would break at eleven, have lunch, and you know sleep for about forty-five minutes at twelve, and wake up for zohar around one. So it's kind of regimented. Oh. It was a good system. Okay. Yeah. And so how long did that take you? I was there for a year, Marshall. Marshall. And in one year you were one finished. Year, yeah. 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 And so then generally what happens afterwards, I mean, specifically for yourself, but also, I guess, you know, other classmates, like you said, it was a preparatory yeah, school. So, so school is efficient because it's the output is meant to go on to yeah, further so studies. Then, then you, you would go to another madrasa where they taught higher level or elementary Arabic and higher level Islamic studies and the dime a dozen there, so you can pick and choose anyone. Okay. Uh, I w was fortunate to meet up with some students uh, in Jamaat um, from Bangalore. Okay. Sabir Rashad is the name of the school there. And kind of, I like the idea of being able to converse in English, <laughs> because in Gujarat nobody speaks uh, English at all, so it's a bit difficult. Okay. Not that I couldn't, but I, I just thought in order to maintain my ability to, to uh, you know, teach back in England, mm. I needed to continue with that trend of speaking in English. So I went there. There were a lot of foreigners there, okay. people from, uh, you know, West Indies, Barbados, Trinidad, and even a few from the States, a few converts from the States. You might know some of them, Molana Zubair from Arizona, Molana Harun, Molana Sabil Haq. Oh, yeah. Okay. So they're the old timers. So the, I went there to Bangalore, Sabil Rashad is the name, and I was there for three years doing my initial Arabic. And I also met my Sheikh there. Yes. Sheikh Muhammad Miran. Tell us about Sheikh Muhammad Miran for Sheikh sure. Sheikh Muhammad Miran, an amazing personality. Very young, just um, super intelligent, mashallah. And well, he had many great traits. One was positive thinking. He never allowed anybody to be negative about anything. Uh, so if he wanted to do something, he would make dua and say, yes, please go and do it. But he would be realistic also. Uh, but his knowledge of tasawwuf and his insights into Shah Waliullah Ghazali and Ibn Arabi is just mind blowing. Mm. Now, I didn't understand too much of it at that time, but he put me on the track to say, okay, you do these studies that you're doing in the madrasa, and as you're doing that, uh, maybe you want to take one or two courses on this also, so, which I did. Okay. So that kind of opened many doors, okay. many doors for us. Marshall. What what is the objective of Sabil al Rashad? It's meant to sort of put you, move you on to the next level. Yes. Now, Sheikh Muhammad Miran, does he specifically take a liking to you, or you sought him out? I mean, what, what was that relationship? I think it's a bit of both. A little bit of both. Okay, mashallah. <laughs> yeah, a bit of both. Uh, he definitely uh, liked people to ask questions about okay. uh, tasawwuf, but he also said you have to focus on your main studies also. Okay. Yeah, this is a side thing. Don't mm. get distracted. And so Sabir Rashad in general was uh, founded by another great wali of Allah, Maulana Abu Saud, alhamdulillah. And, uh, you know, he, he came from the tablighi background and he kind of implemented a few tablighi rules in the madrasa, which is good. They were very good. You had to go out in Jamaat every Thursday uh, with your bedding, with your food, mm -hmm. uh, into other parts of Bangalore where nobody's going to host you, nobody's going to invite you to any food or anything. You just make your own food, sleep in the, sleep in the mud and come back the next day. Now, is that different from Jawla? Jaw it's slightly different. Okay, okay, slightly. okay. So, so uh, that was sort of the, um, I mean, I don't want to say ideology because that often becomes a pejorative, but yeah. I understand what you mean. Yeah. Um, but you mentioned the Sawwuf, and I want to pause there for a moment as well, because typically, at least for the lay, lay person, for people outside of the tradition, uh, generally the uh, Darul Ulum systems in India are not affiliated with the Sawwuf. Mm. They generally see that as the purview of, say, don't yeah. want to name specifics, but other, you know, educational systems. Yeah. Was he an exception in the fact that he stressed 
Tasawwuf and people like Shah Waliullah and yeah. Imam al-Ghazali. Yeah, definitely. He okay. was an exception, uh, but he was subtle about it. He didn't want to upset the administration, obviously. <laughs> hey, what are you doing here? You're causing a rebellion, mutiny or something. So he, he was very careful. Very careful. Any comment on why that exists, that, that sort of dichotomy between Tasawwuf and the sort but, of Darul well, Ulum systems? Well, to, to be honest, I don't think there is any dichotomy. It, okay. it was just that uh, if you don't know your aqidah properly, and if you don't know your fiqh properly, you can't really go into Tasawwuf because it's, it can be <coughs> very misleading. Right. That is just preca precautionary. Okay. okay. But okay. you need to know Arabic and Urdu, you need to know how to read the books, and you need a base for your Sharia, right? Mm. And that was everybody's methodology. Yeah. We did have that system in Dilban in the early uh, 30s that everybody who graduated would find the sheikh after they graduated and then stay with the sheikh for at least a year, maybe two years, before they went into the community. Yeah. So that that was always there in, in the air. Nobody disliked the soul. Okay. Everybody loved the soul. Mm. Uh, part, it was in the blood, in the culture. It was everywhere in the air. The Urdu language uh, of itself lends itself to the soul, as we know. So it, it's just to make sure that only those who are capable can actually go out and learn it. Mm. So it's a bit of a headhunting thing. <laughs> yeah. Right. So how long were you there at? at, at so the Rashad was there three years. Okay. Uh, I left for various reasons. One was that I, I I thought the pace of studies was not really fast enough. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, wh when you come from you know the west you you you're used to intense studying and you're used to homework and mm. you're used to a fast pace which is organized and systematic i, I just thought because the mothers are hosted quite a few minors and the minors in the class because they're not really ready to learn that kind of intense stuff uh, they held the class back and that's why they had to slow down the curriculum so i thought i could speed it up a bit and uh, I, I, I was able to do that. Oh. Yeah. It, this is the late 70s, likely? Uh, it's late, late 70s. Yeah. yeah, late 70s. I'm just curious about, was there anything that you comes to mind? Maybe there isn't, but is there anything that comes to mind about how things were in that time frame, in the city, in, in the country even, that's mm. noticeably different? They just wanted to comment or share, share, share. Yeah, there was always we, we always had one eye on the newspapers, just to be aware of what's happening. And obviously, the teachers would discuss political issues to make sure we are well aware of what's happening on the ground, etc. So yeah, there there was at that time the state of emergency, which Indira Gandhi had imposed on the Muslims, basically that Muslims had a curfew, and and in in fact there was also a nationwide. Uh, a very aggressive campaign to, you know, uh, make sure Muslim men have a vasectomy. So she mm. thought the population was growing too fast, and she would pick up Muslims from the train station and say, "You come here," and it was very violent. Oh wow! Mashallah. So that's th yeah. I mean, the reason I asked is because you hear there's a perception now that things are bad, very bad, very and they are, and they are, and right. very anti. But but. It sounds like it, there was it wasn't it wasn't all uh, yeah, it's, roses it's, back then uh, either. I think uh, you know persecution of Muslims was common. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't as widespread as, as it is today. You still had dignity. It's, it's still safe to travel. Mm. There's no harm in traveling anyway in India, and but that only lasted about two three months. The whole thing, mm. and she she kind of backed away from that, and because there are just so many riots. Uh, as a reaction to that, the Muslims of India just write it. Right. Uh, that's the this only isn't their they have, yeah. early 70s, is it? Uh, mid 70s. Okay, because 73 is the war. I thought maybe because of the war, you know. Uh, and, no, and, it, uh, it, it was uh, late 70s, very okay. late. Okay. Yeah. okay. Is that area considered a little more supercharged in those tensions than, than mm. any other area? And if so, yes, I'm it, it, it was kind of endemic. Yeah. Some of the, the Gujarat was a hub for violence, uh, and maybe Bihar was another hub. Delhi was a hub. Uh, so, 
But uh, that, that's why it was quite frightening to know that this is happening. So should I go back to England or <laughs> what am I doing here? Mm. Yeah. But it, it was okay. Allah gave us afia. Um, we were able to stay there for the duration of the studies. Which was how many years then, yeah, so that, far? Yeah, set, now it was now five years. Five years. Yeah. And then you go to Karachi? Then I went to Karachi. In Karachi, my objective, alhamdulillah, was met. I, I just said I wanted to speed up my studies right. and see if I can take a shortcut without taking a shortcut. <laughs> I was able to combine you know, books from year four and five into one year, which really helped, mashallah. Yeah. Okay. And how long were you in Karachi then? In Karachi, I was just there for a year. Okay. Uh, I left not because of the studies or the mothers. The mothers, I was fine. Mm. Great teachers, Marshall, but my health was not the best mm. in Karachi. I okay. had health problems. Oh, okay. So you come back to India then? Then I came back to England for a, a visit. Right. Then I came back to Deoband, basically, the last two years. Now you're in Deoband proper. In Deoband proper, yeah. Okay. Um, I guess a slight detour, if you will, or a pause here, because I think for some listeners of ours, we've certainly talked about Deoband on the show, but we've never had someone, I think, so intimately connected with the school uh, and the vision as yourself. So if you if you could, just, you know, maybe a few minutes discussing the place that Deoband occupies in, in India, mm. vis-a-vis, you know, because you have the different sort of schools of, or approaches to education, whether it's Natwatul Ulema or Deoband or... Anyway, these all sort of come from a common spring, but nonetheless, they all each uh, form their unique sort of courses. So, um, uh, and I'm using a, the water analogy, not courses as in courses of study. If you could then talk a little bit about Deoband for the sake of our listeners. Deoband is a kind of a central... Sen- Madrasa, where um, you have feeder madrasas throughout the country. Okay. The other madaris, they 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 are feeders. So what you do, you do your primary studies in a smaller madrasa, mm-hmm. and you finish complete your studies the last two years, especially in Durban, where they have the you know state of the art lecturers in every field. And so that's why you go to Durban for to make sure you have the polished product mm. at the end of your studies. So that, that it serves the other madaris this way. Okay. And that's how it became an epicenter for all the ulama also, that everybody loves Dilban basically. Mm. And uh, the style of uh, you know uh, teaching and learning is very different. It's more like a university campus. I see. The, the students are not monitored. They're not regulated. In the smaller madaris, they're monitored and regulated. Mm. So in Dilban, the philosophy was, you make it or you break it. <laughs> we don't care. Sink or swim. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And Alhamdulillah, everybody, as far as I know, made it in terms of remaining Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> right. Nobody's going to come knocking on your door to wake up for Fajr. Okay. But somehow when you go to the masjid, the masjid is full. <laughs> so the, the iman was alhamdulillah at a higher level. Mm. So the, the, and that gave you the freedom to think. Okay. That you're not being monitored by the teachers as to what is it is you're saying or believing or thinking, what it is you're promoting. So the students would have very open discussions, just like any college, basically, any university, mm. which helped the students grow and understand, appreciate uh, the... You know the enormous um, responsibility of scholarship. I see that if we're going to have freedom of thought, then we better make sure what we're saying and thinking is Islamic. So there, there were no deviants there. No deviant movement has started from Dilbert, mashallah. Mm. And that's a testimony to the credibility of the knowledge. That's right. Yeah. Right. But it happened only because they, they allowed mature students to think and to discuss and even debate. They would have debate competitions in the school. But every two weeks, you'd have what we call an anjuman, a club. Okay. And each club will be represented by various students. And the students will pick a subject. Uh, and, you know, sometimes they're, they're, I mean, they're fascinating subjects. And so, Is the night better than the day? <laughs> oh, like that. Yeah. Okay, okay. And you know you'd have to come and disprove the chasm, the opponent, uh, and so. But but they created an environment of debate. I see. 
that let's debate this issue. Mm. And there were no referees. The students were the referees. <laughs> <laughs> so it's fascinating stuff. Uh, they, they would pick up, you know, issues of fiqh okay. between, uh, even amongst the Hanafis. One Hanafi says this, the Hanafi says this. So the spirit of debate was, was very real, and that is what the Hanafi mother basically likes, the, the spirit of debate, that you, yeah. you, you get to the truth by organizing your thoughts, uh, by presenting your rationale, and by conceding that the other party also has a point of view, but we're going to destroy it. <laughs> right. So that was the kind of free-ish environment we right. had. That they're, 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 you weren't held hostage to, yeah. you know, a strict opinion. Right. Yeah. Even though in the dars, in the lesson itself, the teacher may be promoting a very strict opinion. Or one opinion over the other. Yeah. But it didn't matter to the students. Students were free to think. Okay. On the whole. On the whole. Yeah. You think the, the, the Hanabi school, I don't want to say is singularly or uniquely positioned to do that, but it certainly promotes this idea of recognizing plurality, uh, recognizing the idea that you, you're, you're going to have variations within the school itself. Mm. And so that, I think, created these kind of, this kind of atmosphere, would yeah, you say? Yeah. yeah, but there was an orthodoxy even then, okay. and they maintained the orthodoxy in thought. That we, we we do have guardrails. We're not going to go outside of what the sure. you know, ulama and mashaykh think. But within what they think, there are various roads and avenues and alleyways, and you can take any which one of them. You get to your destination. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's fiqh. But how about uh, like for example, aqidah? Is there also that approach of aqidah? Uh, as I said, they were very orthodox in aqidah. They won't venture outside of what was the norm. And that being? Yeah. yeah. I mean, like something like Khatun Nabuwa, uh -huh. finality of Prophet right. is a very big thing. Right. Obviously, the, the, the idea that we are Sunni and we are not Shia, uh, the idea that we don't subscribe to the Barilwi uh, influence, we don't subscribe to Sir Sayyid Khan's mission, basically. Mm. Uh, so in the Qida, they are very, very kind of normal, orthodox, okay. uh, insulated almost. Hmm? Yeah, I meant to ask about like kalam or the approach to the you know theology. So they had the, some kalam. They they do study the some method. kalam, not as much as I would have liked. Okay. Eventually. But is that generally within the realm of within the, the uh, so, you know Sunni Maturidi, Maturidi. Ashari okay. kind of confines, uh, which is broad enough. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but they they as I said that they remained very loyal to the Dilbandi slant. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. The Dilban Island, basically, I mean, is, is that Maulana Qasim Nanotri was the theologian par excellence. Okay. There was no greater theologian in India, including Shawalilah, in my opinion, than Maulana Qasim. He is a mind-boggling, amazing creativity in the way he articulated positions, in the way he represented positions. And that all came down, filtered into his grandson, Qaridayam. Okay. He was a mesmerizing theologian and ethicist. So that he, he talked about the abstract values uh, from the old classical age where, you know, he, he was so privy. One day in his uh, majlis, he, he started speaking about, you know, which faculty is better than the other. Okay. Uh, is the faculty of hearing better than the faculty of seeing? And what does this mean in aqidah? And how do we represent now seeing? And how do we represent hearing? So, you know, what the heck is this? You know? <laughs> never heard right. of such things. Yeah, so, um, I mean, it came down from Mawr al Qasim, who's actually you know, from the tradition of Shah Abdul Aziz and Shah Waliullah. But he, he, through his, uh, you know, genius mind, he, he was so rational. Okay. Just so right. His proofs were rational. And he only spoke in the Kalami language. So, his, his books are somewhat difficult to read. But if you read them, it, it will make you a thinker. Hmm. And that's where Qari Tayyib inherited everything, his methodology, his, you know, propositions, his, you know, what do you call it, major premise, minor premise, and all of that. Right. So Dilband was, was definitely seasoned with a lot of kalam, a lot of logic, uh, and I think it was just great to be around those people who were masters. Right. And that's at the level they spoke, which is, which is what you get in Dilbert. The level of scholarship just rises instantaneously as you step into Dilbert. 
I understand. And you spent two years there. Yeah, two years. And then after that year in Bangalore again? No, what oh. happened there, I didn't go back to Bangalore. Right. I stayed with my sheikh for a few months. Right. Alhamdulillah. Then I, uh, which was a fascinating experience. Understanding the ins and outs of dhikr and various meditations and... Are you part of a particular tariqa at yes, that time? Yes. Hmm. I'm part of several tariqas. Um, initially, primarily Chishtiya, and we moved into Naqshbandiya, and then uh, Akbariya, the, the tariqa of uh, Ibn Arabi. Uh -huh. so then eventually it's all Akbari. Yeah. Okay. Was now, now, it's Qad now it's Qadri through the other sheikh. Oh, how does that work? Well, then you, and I ask this as yeah, someone who... Yeah, I mean, who... because you, what you do, is, it's all in the prescriptions, ah, the adhkar. Okay. What makes you a Qadri or a Chishti. Yeah. There's no real well, theological difference. Okay. There's none of that. Mm -hmm. People assume there's some kind of substantial theological, theological difference with the Qadriya and the Qadriya. They're all Sunni. No, of course. Yeah. Right, right. And there's no difference because the end goal is the same. Yeah. That is to reach Allah and Allah's follow. Of course. Yeah. I, I guess I was trying to understand the merger because my approach has just been take the, take the prescription, don't ask questions, but or, or don't try to figure out where the medicine comes from. But there is a, at the same time a curiosity of the Akbari and uh, Qadri. Yeah. Yeah, and how those sort of intersect and what they mean for the for people who are listening. The Sheikh Akbar, uh, Akbar. was a, you know, second generation. His yeah. Sheikh was the murid of Abdul Qadir Jilani. Okay. So he's one step removed. Okay. So basically, he, he, he does count as a Qadri, but he formed his own tariqah of what we call suluk, meaning the dhikr he prescribes is not Qadri, it is Akbari. Even though the, as I said, the mafum, the concept is the same. Okay. Abdul Qadir Jilani, obviously, being the, the greatest sheikh, mashallah. That's right. Alhamdulillah, he's the master of all shiuch. He has his prescriptions, mm -hmm. and even those prescriptions, uh, the, the different countries took different prescriptions. So the Qadri of India will be very different from the Qadri of Gambia. Which really fascinates me. Yeah, because then this is localized, it's contextual, okay. and that's the uh, versatility of the Suluk. Okay. Yeah. That you can do it this way. This the, the objective is to reach Allah. So, uh, what's your problem? <laughs> Except that because of your mindset, because of your climate, geography, topography, the food you eat, the customs that you're used to, the things you have to do to, you know, um, take care of your family, they're very different. Okay. They're very endemic. You know? mm. So you can't have a you know one solution for every community. You have to account, meaning that the you know the, the Qadri Sinsila in Malaysia is very different mm. because of the culture. Okay. And so on. The Qadri Sinsila of you know East Africa is very different from West Africa. Mm. And so on. So So yeah. I wanna come back. I, I definitely wanna pick up on Gambia. We'll get to it later. But so I guess fast forward, get us to the point where you've completed your studies now. Yeah, then from uh, going back to Bangalore, right. I went to Bihar, UP, uh, Bihar. Okay where there was this great faqih, Hanafi faqih, uh, who was from Durban. Mm -hmm. In fact, he was roommates with my father. <laughs> okay. uh, I didn't know that until much later. Really? Oh, yeah. that wasn't the impetus? No. No, okay. No, he came to Durban, and obviously he just showed off his fiqh, you know, <laughs> to everybody. And he invited us. He said, come and spend some time with me. I'll teach you a few things. So I took up the invitation. Went to Bihar. Uh, uh, it's called uh, Imarat Sharia. It's the um, the place where you have a Muslim personnel court. So there are only two, three states in India that are allowed a Muslim personnel kind of court to, you know, advise with regards to Muslim personal, personal law. law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that was Bihar and Orissa, which ne they're next door to each other. And the right. other is Karnataka, where Mona Abu Saud was. The Amir of Sharia. <laughs> right. So from one Amir, I went to another Amir. <laughs> right. right. Alhamdulillah. Yes. Uh, so he was phenomenal mm -hmm. in his fiqh, in his ability to, to give you angles into one issue that you never heard of. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was the icing on the cake. Okay. The completion of the fiqh studies, basically. And I really benefited from his uh, mindset, his approach, all of his uh, you know ideas, and his very, very 
accommodating, let's, let's put it that way. But very strict in his usul. Um, so that was that. So I, I got one path on Tasawwuf from Sheikh Miran, one path in Fiqh from Qadi Mujahid Islam, okay. and one path in intellectual, you know, thinking from Qaytayyab. Okay. Alhamdulillah. Right. Yeah. And then you returned to the to, to England to. No, I came back to England. Right. I'm bored to death. <laughs> <laughs> what am I going to do here? There's yeah. nothing to do here. Right. So, <laughs> so what I did is somehow I found uh, an Islamic kind of publishing agency. that They, 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 they were publishing, uh, you know, magazines, uh, translating from Arabic to English. And he was a Saudi kind of, you know, businessman who had a lot of money. Okay. And he opened this organization called the Islamic Press Agency. Okay. So I managed to crawl in and find myself a job. <laughs> and I said, this works. I didn't mm -hmm. want to be there in the masjid listening to the community issues. I, I was too young to right. understand the family issues. I wasn't mm -hmm. interested. So I said, let me escape from here. <laughs> it's funny, like recent scholars we've talked to who've gone and studied overseas, yeah. whether it's whether it's Egypt or Morocco or wherever it is, they always say, like, you, you don't come back expecting, like, a whole bunch of job offers, like if you went and got a computer science degree yeah. or something. It's a, it's a different expectation. Yeah, no, exactly. But there was nothing there in the UK. So I just found this company. I said, okay, let me write to them. And I pleaded with the one of the directors. They said, please give me a job because <laughs> if you don't give me a job, I'll be stuck in the masjid doing nothing. <laughs> <laughs> he actually responded. Mm -hmm. He said, I like your attitude, so yeah, welcome. Come and join us. <laughs> Are you married at this time? No. Okay, okay. No. no. So you're in your late late 20s, I'm, I'm assuming. I'm early in my 30s? early 20s. Uh, early 20s, okay. Uh, very okay. early 20s, yeah. Okay. 22. Okay. Uh, mashallah. So mashallah. we're almost at like 1980 then. So um, Early 80s, yeah. Early 80s. So then I, I know just in a few years later, you'll be, you find yourself in the United States. Yeah, then I so, came over. It was a visit, basically. So how did that start? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's just, again, being very, unfortunately, British eccentric. <laughs> we get tired and bored very easily. So we have to move on from one thing to another. It's the same mindset. Right. Doesn't matter how you slice yeah. the cake, you always be from the culture you came from. Right. So I came over here for a visit. Right. Uh, Although you say that as someone now who's lived here three plus decades. So yeah. we'll get to that though, in Chicago. But yeah. anyway, sorry. Yeah, so then uh, yeah. I, was, I landed on the West Coast. So that's when yeah. My wife still teases me, why didn't you just stay there? You know? <laughs> <laughs> Every time you come out to the Bay Area, your wife. That's very different. Most people land on the East Coast and yeah, travel yeah. West, but yeah. you did the opposite. Yeah, I did the opposite, uh, basically. I just wanted to uh, travel from the West to the East, so I would depart from the East. So where'd you land? San Francisco. Oh, our, our neck of the woods. Yeah. 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 And uh, I stayed a few days, met a few people. I met a guy from, student of, of from Berkeley, Pakistani child, nice guy. And he immediately said, your value is in Chicago. Ah. It's off the bat. Hmm. He said, you have no value here. I don't know why, but now hindsight is twenty twenty. maybe yeah. he was right. <laughs> <laughs> if I invented a time machine, I'd go back and, uh, you know, compel him to make a different argument, uh, <laughs> to convince Sheikh Amin that the, it was, a, in fact, there was a lot of value to stay there. <laughs> but probably just in terms of pure <laughs> yeah. Muslim population probably, yeah, requiring... Yeah. Yeah. The, no, but I, I didn't know any better, right? So yeah. I'm going on taqlid of this guy here. So. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I didn't think it through. I, I, I was visiting anyway, so it doesn't matter to me at that yeah. time whether yeah. I stay there. You know. yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so then uh, you slowly see you start uh, making your way east or yeah, yeah. i came and uh, huh? you came here straight i came to chicago i didn't have any intentions to stay okay i was just visiting but oh. it, it was very close to ramadan hopefully it wasn't like uh, december january february <laughs> no it was summer okay good it, it was steaming <laughs> hot Gosh, i'll tell you the story of the tarawi in, in a second but i came here uh -huh. And there was a family that hosted me, mashallah. He, he, he owned uh, several gas stations and he was very kind and said, stay with me for a week or so. And, uh, he had his own plan. 
Mm. Which was? That to make me stay. <laughs> I see. Right. Yeah. Ulterior motive. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So eventually they, they all kind of ganged up on me and said, you can't leave now because Ramadan is around the corner. We've never had Tarawi here. Mm. So you have to do this. It's fold on you to uh, do our Tarawi for us. And so, I said, you can't blackmail me like that, but I'll do Tarawi here, it's no problem. <laughs> now, they meant that particular masjid, I assume. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Now, that in Batavia, Marshall. But at that time, they didn't have a physical space, so there was no real space for us to gather and do Tarawi. We, we, okay. we were using the basement of a church, which mm -hmm. I think some other communities did, which was a, a great service, I think, that Muslims should benefit from. And they, they, they were hosted by a Christian nation. So they shouldn't be too arrogant about, you know, saying what they say about the Ahlul Kitab. They should, they should be willing to at least concede that they, they, they did allow us to be here. Like in England, uh, we converted churches into Masajid. So I came here. That we had, uh, we, it was some, uh, you know, a generous guy, Marshall, allowed us to pray in his business attic where there was no AC. And you're talking about uh, July. Super hot. You just perspire. And uh, that's how, there was no AC, there was no fan. There weren't even too many lights. <laughs> <laughs> And throughout so you're the day, just sweating and sweating and sweating, right. and you're doing the tarawih. And so but anyway, we we managed, alhamdulillah. And throughout the day, on on the second floor, usually upper levels, the heat just accumulates because yeah, heat, they, heat rises no, it, from it, below. It, it was super hot. Super right, hot. right, right. Marshall. So right. anyway, so where was this? This is still Batavia. Uh, yeah, Batavia, Batavia, which yeah. is a sort of out there suburb, right? Yeah, just but kind of far. Well, see, is it, yeah, it's past Elgin. Just no, north of Elgin. North of Elgin. The, right. the only silver lining was the fasts were shorter <laughs> than in the UK in the summer. <laughs> oh, is that Yeah, right? but in the UK, it doesn't get this hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You never feel it. You're trading one thing for another. Yeah, right? yeah. Uh, okay, so then, um, so they convinced you to stay. Yeah. Okay. You're still not married. You're still not, you're not married at I'm this time. I'm not married. So then uh, how long do you end up staying in that first stint? Uh, the first stint I was there, the, I stayed there again two years. Okay. I had to move on. I established a little bit of a pseudo organization called the Islamic Academy, where I, I started to teach young college students Islam on the weekends, and they gave me some money enough to survive, I guess. And, okay. Uh, yeah. And and meanwhile, Chicago Muslim community is is growing. Is growing very fast in the eighties. Yeah. Is right? this the eighties? Like late eighties? No, it's the eighties. Yeah. 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 Late eighties. No. Yeah, yeah. No, you're eight, talking about eighty-five, eighty-six. Okay. Okay. So, it's, so um, massive Muslim population explosion yes. happening. Yes. Yeah. Especially the near the Devon area, Elston MCC yeah. area, the South yeah. Side. Okay. Bridger okay. area. And even a resurg and a resurgence or um, uh, interest again in Islam amongst mm. the folks who had come here in the well, 60s that came and 70s. ironically through the Iranian Revolution. It came through Khomeini. Uh, the Shias did a good job in college campuses and universities to, you know, spark a curiosity in Muslim students about the USA and. So this is anti-USA, so the, those students who were there in the middle to late 80s, they were all pro-Khomeini. Okay. I'm talking about Sunnis. Oh, yeah. Mm. Yeah, which was a challenge. Yeah. And unfortunately, they even uh, institutionalized Muta on campus. Oh, really? I'm serious, yeah. Uh -oh. <laughs> so that's the Shia machine, basically. But th they said that there's no one standing up to the U.S. except this guy. So yeah. he must be doing something right. <laughs> <laughs> wow! I only remember that, that because, and you're probably probably a little younger. I mm -hmm. bet your older brothers, uh, brother and sister, remember this. Where even in Sunni communities, the pro Khomeini propaganda was high, very very high. I mean, yeah. S uh, in terms of distributing materials, I remember as a as a young kid going to Eid prayers like Houston. And, uh, you know, there'd be people passing out pamphlets and propaganda, essentially, mm. pro-Khomeini propaganda. The only thing I remember as a kid when yeah. I was 13 was when the Satanic Verses came out. Well, that's, yeah. And not to go on a tangent, no, but I do remember a lot of Sunnis 
kind of agreeing, agreeing yeah. either d directly or indirectly, yeah. right? Right, right. And that's would be what 1980s, 89. So we're getting yeah. Because yeah. I want to get to a point in in time. Um, so after about two years, you you move on and you go to you go back to the to to England. Well, what happened was I got married and okay, so that's when that my happens. My wife didn't have a green card, so okay. she wasn't able to come back. So at that time, I I decided to be with her during the pregnancy and apply for a green card, which happened okay. Within a year, we were able to, you know, receive the green card. It wasn't too difficult, alhamdulillah. But then, since I had lost touch with the Islamic Academy, and I didn't want to come back and say, hey, look, you know, I'm back here. It'd be a bit of a burden, intrusion on, on, the, on their life. And so uh, I looked for a job elsewhere, and I, alhamdulillah, there was a a very nice uh, philanthropist friend of ours who, who passed away. Mm -hmm. uh, his son was always in touch. And they, they found an opening for us in Wichita, Kansas. And That's so they, they need an imam there, please come back. And said, okay, we'll try it out. I said, don't know too much about Wichita, but my son was born there, so. <laughs> <laughs> very different than Chicago. Very, very different, different than Chicago. Chicago. But it, it was a student population community. It's a transient community where people were now just starting to settle there mm. because they raised their families and their kids were growing up, so they decided to settle. But it's still 70% students. Okay. <coughs> Any Arab students? Uh, from Plenty the, from of them. The... Plenty of Arabs, mm. uh, plenty of uh, <coughs> Pakistanis. Okay. Uh, plenty of Afro-American converts. They were there, and that was a mixture in the masjid. Hmm. So the um, masjid there in Wichita, Masjid Anur, was very diverse in its ethnicity and obviously the usual problems of the community. Okay. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, trying to gather them, bring them onto one one book was difficult, never mind the same page. Uh, but they needed some kind of authority figure to be there. Right. So Alhamdulillah, I gained, you know, th their confidence and uh, developed credibility. So an issue came up, even in the board, they came to me to resolve the issue. And, and they, they became so dependent on me that they made me the president. Oh, I see. <laughs> yes, I said, I'm not up for this, so I better get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> you don't see that happen often in in, in my Yeah, exactly, in, in especially Masaji. the people yeah. who, you know, usually, you know, there's always a bias. Of course. Against uh, Pakistani Indian scholar, anywhere you go, but they 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 just threw that out for some reason. The community became unified, and now they have things going. The vibrant community now they have two schools, one school and two masjids. Mm, okay, they're doing okay. Mashallah. And so, how long how long was that? That was two years. Two years <laughs> so also. Two years okay. stints. Yeah, I see there. these two year stints as a trend. But then, what brings you back to Chicago then? Yeah, then what happened in England, while I was okay. in England, yeah. I, I, I developed the concept of Dara Qasim. Okay, I see. So Dara Qasim was conceived in England. Did not know that, okay. Yeah, and I, I thought that um, uh, we have to do something to distribute knowledge uh, at a higher level. I wanted to actually ask you about that because you mentioned Islamic Academy, though. And so the, the I, I would imagine, at least in a, in a way, the, the vision was the same. Disseminating, um, no? That was more of ad hoc. Uh, the need of the time for me personally. For you personally, not yeah. so much the community. Yeah, in this that case. Al Qasim came per the instructions of the Sheikh, Sheikh Miran. Was there, so you thought there was obviously a need just based on what was going on in the Muslim community in America, but was, was there any specific incident or moment or spark that resulted in the in the vision of Dar al Qasim, or was it kind of something that happened organically over time? No, as, as I said, it was the uh, inspiration of Sheikh Miran. He mm. actually told me, mm. it's about time you did something for the Ummah, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So I thought about it, like, this is one thing I can do, so kind of distribute knowledge in a very organized, structured way. Okay. Yeah, so that was, that, that was the impetus, basically. Okay. But it was conceived in England. You also mentioned earlier that England, when compared to India, for example, you talked about the the level of structure mm. and the comparison there. Mm. Maybe, maybe you were experiencing the same thing, the small town kind of way to educate versus yeah. versus the, it, the previous it, experience. Uh, yeah. would not have developed in England. Uh, the, the environment was not conducive to that kind of um, instruction. 
Okay. So although it's, it was conceived there, it, it wasn't meant to find a home there. No. Why, though? I, I think you were trying to make that point with, in response well, to what a, Omar just some, asked. Some very yeah. good, I think, um, societal values in the USA, which we don't find in too many other countries. Okay. One is adult education. Mm. In mainstream USA, there's still mm, yeah. a strong, strong culture yeah. for adult education. So true. That's and, great. Uh, yeah. I, I believe that came into and seeped into some of the Muslim people. Mm. Right. So if there was a place where we could do adult education, mm. then it would have been the USA. Mm, right. Yeah. You know, just speaking on that topic, I I feel like in my lifetime, I've seen a major increase in the interest in into in adult education, like yeah. even amongst compared to twenty years ago, yeah. for many reasons. So that's yeah. interesting. I never thought about it as compared to uh, non-Americans. Yeah, it's, right. It's, it's, um, so we you experienced the boon that we've yes. seen, yeah. yeah, within yeah. America. Yeah, yeah. You no, know, that's what I mean. And so yeah. fascinating, though. That's an identifiable trend that sort of made America, you know, fertile ground. Yeah for the vision that, yeah. that Darul Qasim had, which yeah. then leads to the question, so then the vision then was for adult, like not necessarily students alone, but people who were young professionals. Yes. Yeah, what is yeah. the vision? To be I, exact, can, I think that's yeah. the question. Yeah. Yeah. To be educated. If you, if you can train the professionals to mm. be Muslim, then your work is done, basically, because they're going to behave, they're going to um, address issues mm. through the Islamic lens, and, and America is a place for aggressive people. It's not a place for passive people. If, if you're passive in the USA, you won't make it. So I think a little, a little bit of orientation, a little bit of a kind of sound, structured, organized, intellectual discussion. Because when I was with the academy, what I found to my surprise was that they actually like intellectual discussions. The students. Right. Right. Yeah, so I thought oh, that, that's a good sign that maybe we're getting somewhere here. <laughs> right. right. And when I came back, it was the same thing. That, okay. Uh, you know, although it take it took a long time, and there was obviously obstacles here, a lot of biases and a lot of kind of misrepresentation. You know, yeah. All of that, and then you, you had the typical Chicago power politics. Uh, why is this guy coming? Yeah. in controlling, you know. So I decided I'm going to do this outside of the community. <laughs> Literally on the last episode, our guest, Omer, he, he talked about the culture of Chicago, including one of uh, ring kissing, a lot of ring kissing here. So this is what he called it, I remember. And and as someone who knows Chicago, I completely related to that. So it's it's interesting that you, men you happen to mention it as well. That yeah. That's just sort of imbued in the culture here. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. you need permission to sneeze. That's right. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say you need permission to use a bathroom. Right, that would, <laughs> that'd be a little right. That would be too dark. <laughs> <laughs> so, real, in terms of the you, so yeah. you mentioned professionals. Yeah. So it was the vision. Hey, uh, we're going to you know somebody who's a yeah. uh, an engineer. Oh. We're going to help get them lawyer, doctor, uh, all, yeah, all, yeah all, any professional mm -hmm. more so than like an eighteen year old high school grad who wants to study full time. Is that, is that yeah? I mean, yes. the, but the, the, we, we had to appeal to the eighteen year old also so that so yeah. we could recruit them for the one year program. Mm. We started basically with appetizer courses, just discussions on major themes of, of the Quran, du'as of the Quran, stories of the Quran. So that's how we brought them in, a one hour lecture, no, what you call it, subscription to classes, right. uh, no commitment to anything, just come and listen, be happy. Halakha style. Yeah, no, halakha, oh. there, there's no intellectual discussion. Hmm. Here we actually had discussions. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I'm going to give you an idea, what do you think about it? No uh, no brick and mortar, there's no, no you're kind of traveling at the yeah, various massages. I did use, alhamdulillah, the community resources here and yes. there. Right. Like I use the foundation for, I, I use CPSA quite a bit. Okay. Alhamdulillah for the initial classes. And then we, we, we found a way to rent space. The, some of the Dar al-Qasim members found enough money to rent a space. When is this now? This is now, you're talking about uh, 1998. Reason, because you, you skipped over when I first meet you. So I meet you in 1991. Now, of course, I don't expect mm. you to remember it. You probably, but I, I think I have sh uh, shared the story at least with you. But, uh, 1991, I was visiting, had come here for spring break because, you know, I had an uncle who used to live in Palatine at the time. So I would come and spend my spring breaks here and my family. And um, I got to meet people who I'd already connected with in Chicagoland uh, through Minna, 
So it was people like Azhar Usman and, and, and Amjad Qadri and Habib Qadri and others. Um, and I don't remember exactly who, but I, I have a strong memory that it was actually Azhar, Azu. Um, Azhar said, oh, no, 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 you haven't seen anything yet. And I was, in, I, I was at a particular place, and I, I think I've shared it on this show, but we don't need to do it today, in terms of where I was, in terms of my sort of ideology or ideological frame with regards to Islam and Islamic studies and formal studies and so on. And so he wanted to, I think, his, his, he wanted to sort of dispel what, I, what, what he thought I was bringing in terms of my approach to uh, Islamic studies. And uh, he said, no, no, I'm gonna take you to a halakha that's gonna blow your mind, I mean, in so many words. And so at that time, you used to do a fiqh class at MEC, I believe. Oh, yes. Skokie. Saturday mornings, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> so I remember that it was boys uh, fiqh class, and at that, that I was only there, again, because you I think it was weekly. So I came and um, I happened to attend, and at that time we were doing, uh, I think it was like a two or three part just on the wiping of the feet mm. in fiqh. And I had never seen that level of sort of scholarship or never even appreciated that that's what the breadth of the tradition was. At that time, everything was black and white. You have this hadith. You know, there you go, you know, go to town. Uh, the idea that there was complexity and there was, uh, you know, uh, w one position and w what the merit of that position was and what was the, um, uh, the, the basis of that position and why the school took that position. So anyway, I had never seen uh, education like that. I had never seen tr the tradition presented in that way. That was MEC, yeah, Skokie. Uh, anyway, so that's the first time I encounter you. So at that time, were you, what was, you, so you came back with this sort of directive, if you will, to establish this school or, yeah, the, this institution. Um, but yet you're, so at that time, you're still using the resources or, uh, you know, not investing or not needing to invest in a brick and mortar, yeah. but rather taking advantage of the resources already available in yeah. the community uh, and planting those seeds, like you yeah, said. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Those seeds, they grew and then they, they became students. And right. Formed students. That's right. And that was the time we, we, I decided we need now a space which is ours. Okay. Yeah, it happened slowly, very slowly. Right. Uh, and you're saying that was the late 90s, you, you yeah, initially yeah, began late, renting? Late 90s, yeah. uh, early 2000s, um, we had a small office. One thing led to another, then we moved into the 999 building down the road. <laughs> Yes. Uh, if you remember. Of course, Main Street, right? Yeah, Main Street. Yeah. And that's where we established ourselves properly, authentically. Right. We were there for three years, alhamdulillah. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is a good space, a very good space. And many people came, alhamdulillah. And they just saw. At that time, I had the luxury of having two teachers with me also. Arabic that's right. teachers, Dr. <laughs> Shukri, Dr. Muhammad. Volkan, he's gone now. He was there. Oh, he was here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, that was also, I think, when uh, Sheikh Hamza was here. No. Sheikh Hamza uh, at the main. Later. Oh, okay. not at the main street. He he was there for a year. Okay. Yeah. Sheikh uh, Hamza Makbul for those who are listening. He came later, but he was there. And then Dr. Omar. Dr. Omar is a fascinating story, uh, Masha, which takes you to Gambia. <laughs> yes. Do you? Yeah, so are you, I, are you free to I, indulge? I had known Dr. Umar yes. for several years prior to that. He, was, he, was, he came here as, you know, a guest of the Novi Foundation. And uh, anyway, so then... That's 2000, uh, I believe, 1999, yeah, so 2000. Dr. Umar at that time didn't know Sheikh Haider, yes. Sheikh Muhammad of the Gam. He didn't know him. Yes. Yeah, so I went to Dubai and uh, for a visit, basically. <laughs> right. And um, there I met Kamran, and I told Kamran, you have to meet this sheikh. Kamran didn't know him either. I see. Bajwa. Kamran Bajwa, yes, of course. He, he didn't know Sorry. him. Sorry, yeah. I said, I'm going to bring someone here, and immediately they just, you know, it's like wildfire. <laughs> then I told Kamran, you have to introduce him to Dr. Omar. So pause. How do you encounter Sheikh Imam Jalani, hmm? Sheikh Haider? How do you encounter? When and yeah, how that's does that take place? In, in of itself, the, the, I have a friend who was in. Could you Dubai, please share that? Uh, Burai, Burai Tahir. He's a okay. PhD from England. He he was here in Chicago, worked with the Northwestern. He was into genetics. I see. So he worked with Northwestern labs, and uh, he was uh, headhunted by Dubai police. 
because uh, his ability skill sets were needed in the CSI, okay. Dubai. Right. So they came here, they gave him an offer he could not refuse. <laughs> he went over there. And then because he had very little connection with me, mm -hmm. he started looking in Dubai for someone. Okay. So he went here and there. He found a few shoes. They, you know, he, he didn't gel with them. And then he found Sheikh Muhammad, okay. who was visiting Dubai. Okay. And then he became, mashallah, attached to him. And then he, he, he told Sheikh Muhammad about me. Sheikh Muhammad said, yeah, I already know him. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's a Sufi way, basically. I was going to say, that's... Yeah. So he said, okay, we have to have you meet guys meet. And so we had a phone call first. And then uh, Burai, with his kindness, arranged an uh, Umrah trip. Well, I could meet Sheikh Muhammad in Jeddah. Mm. That's why, how I met him, Marshall. So that's the story okay. of my meeting the Sheikh. Marshall. Right. Alhamdulillah. I've I've never had the pleasure, but he he looks at least very young. Is he is he younger than you? He's uh, youngish. He's younger than me. Yeah. Definitely. Uh, he's probably now in his late thirties, early forties. That's how he looks then. Uh, but he inherited everything mashallah, from his great father. Subhanallah. Mashallah. No, but Ama amazing be... man. Right. Yeah. Again, but he he like Sheikh Miran. The, I think one of their greatest gifts is his positive thinking. Mm. They will not let you be depressed. Mm. Positive thinking. Doesn't matter which hole you're in, and they'll just bring you out. Yeah. Which is what the Prophet Sassam did. So just so brought so. out all the misery, grief, uh, distress, depression right. from the Sahabas, and they were just not positive thinkers. <laughs> right. So you had already met him. Uh, I'm thinking this is probably 2002, 2003. This was right after 9 11. Okay, right after 9 11. Right. So yeah. or a little earlier. 2001. Yeah. Okay. Because Kamran is still in the United States, that's why for because I, I know he goes to the he, he moves to Dubai in two thousand two, and that's, that's why it. yeah that, I, that's the time okay. I introduced him to the sheikh. Okay, um, so that, that after that, yeah, Kamran introduced Dr. Omar to Sheikh Muhammad, and that was it. And, um, then he became what he is now, mashallah. Uh, we talked about the idea you had, the vision you had for Dal Qasim, but let's now talk about how it starts becoming a reality, how the vision becomes reality, and yeah. what it looks like early on, but more importantly, I'm, yeah. I'm really curiously about where it is today Correct. and where it's headed. That's really yeah. what, what, what I think our listeners would love to hear as well. Yeah, so we, we were in the 999 building down, down the road, is a mile. Mm -hmm. That was a rental space. It was adequate for a few years. It served us well, mashallah. And then we started looking for a bigger facility. As we were growing, students were coming in more and more, and we were recruiting more teachers too. And we asked the real estate agent to look for us, and uh, he came, he found this building. Very nice, alhamdulillah. This was actually part of the building next door, which is part of a main campus for a trucking school. The only thing was that uh, the asking price was too much. We didn't have the funds. So they, they came and they said 3.5 or 6 million or something like that. He said, we don't have that kind of money. <laughs> and uh, the second issue was this building is separate from that building. And then they, the, the uh, owners wanted us to buy the whole parcel, both. So that was the second uh, kind of snag. Mm -hmm. So we said no, and we forgot about it. We just used that building, M make ends meet kind of thing. Mm. A year later, the real estate agent comes back to us. And he said, that building you looked at, you know, is still there. But now they've reduced the price to two million. That's a so nice I'm discount. Like, yeah, <laughs> I mean, 50%. Yeah. Uh, patience kind of does pay off <laughs> yeah, a year and 50 percent uh, that's quite good so yeah. we came here we negotiated down to 1.8 wow. alhamdulillah we managed to uh, you know put a down payment on the building uh, through Allah's fadl and only Allah's fadl we, we paid it off in six months Mashallah. So, uh, well, Barbez and I are from California 
one point eight is yeah. <laughs> a dream. Well, <laughs> Yeah, our uh, laws work, so yeah, laws sort of yeah, right. And, and, and this was in 2019? No. Oh, no, no, a bit no. later than that. Oh, okay. So during no, the no, pandemic? No, no, it was earlier no. than that. Yeah. Or, 17. 17, no. okay, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Was when you fully bought the uh, yeah. facility. Okay. There was nothing really here. Right. They, they had some classrooms, makeshift. Mm. It wasn't very organized. It wasn't, wasn't very pleasing to the eye. And as I said, these two bays were just, just concrete, nothing there, mm. basically. And, so. and again, uh, for having had tour earlier, uh, the aesthetic is, is really nice. Yeah. Um, definitely detail has gone into the way the entrances are lined up, the way the classrooms flow, uh, mm. details such as the names of the classrooms and the art on the classroom doors, yeah. Um, yeah. the technology, the way the rooms are, con center, uh, gender is considered and how the rooms are set up is it's really impressive. Alhamdulillah. So. And so how many are. students are in these halls during the semester? Meaning typically? that we, we have full-time students, right. they're, they're about 45 this year, okay. and 80 plus part-time. Right. Yeah, they work on the evenings and weekends, mostly. Right. So, alhamdulillah, it's, it's a good number, but now we've kind of grown out of this building, too. So. I see. <laughs> Very quickly, mashallah. Yeah. Very quickly. Right. Within three years. So. But you've, mashallah, more recently purchased a newer, or a new campus, yeah. which is larger and was an existing school. An actual it was campus. An existing campus for Northern Illinois. It was a satellite campus. For DeKalb, yeah. purpose-built uh, campus, Alhamdulillah, uh, couldn't buy, uh, couldn't build something like that <laughs> in a hurry. We estimate it would have cost us 15 to 18 million right. to build something like that. I, mean, I would uh, imagine. The, again, that's another long story. I'll cut it short, but at the end, they uh, sold it to us for 2.5 million. Oh, mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. So, so question though, you spoke about outgrowing it looks like it's. I mean, it's a much larger facility than I would have mm. imagined. Than I did imagine. When, yeah. um, it, it does. Uh, you, you can hold conferences easily yeah. in the Musalla auditorium, but you can't hold that many students in the classroom. The classroom sizes are small. That's true. There's uh, there's a lot of class. As you probably noticed, there's a lot of classrooms. Mm -hmm. but they're relatively small. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the sense of maybe ten, fifteen students. And imagine if you break that down by gender. Um, so you can imagine that capacity being reached. So it's not like we entered like a large yeah, lecture right. hall. We, we yes. had calculated yeah. based on the number of car spots available. We only have 98 car spaces. So we had to calculate the classrooms as maybe even if you have seven classrooms with 11, 12 people in there, mm -hmm. you're going to max out at 85, 86, something like that. So that's how we did okay. We did the we did the math basically, <laughs> yeah. And so, uh, to Perez's point, there's not a large lecture hall that can hold all say all 98 at the same time. Yeah. Uh, is that has that is that um, by design or does that become a bit of a, a blocker for the for the approach? Well, it was a concern of ours that um, I predicted three years here, mm. which is what happened. Okay, humbling. Um, um, even though. The auditorium will hold 200, 250 people very easily here. Mm -hmm. right. But as I said, the, the, you can't fit them into a classroom. Right. That's right. And because we have uh, pedagogy and you know grades, right. uh, we need more classroom space, which the other facility does. In the other facility, yeah. every classroom will have at least capacity of 25 students per class and some classrooms will have 40. What is the capacity of that new facility? Of that what we calculate is about 350 Okay. at one time. Right. But we can always do shifts later on. Like we need more personnel, we need more teachers. That's and, right. And so on. Speaking so. of personnel and teachers, then the existing facility boasts how many full-time and or part-time faculty members? We, we have quite a few. Okay. We have at least 13 full-timers. Uh, right. teachers and uh, we have um, two or three part-time teachers and what you need to remember is we also have satellites right. chapters where our graduates are teaching right mm. in other communities like Raleigh is a very vibrant chapter and Hamla is doing great uh, Knoxville is up and coming Dallas now is up and coming mm. The Bay Area is now up and coming. We mm. do have a chapter in the Bay Area, yeah, by okay. the way, you know. Yeah. Yeah. I, have, I have another question. Um, so I, we've been talking for, as you and I, on various topics about the idea of supply and demand. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. we've, we've touched on that on other topics as well. 
but for in terms of supply and demand, are you seeing an increased demand maybe amongst the youth or amongst uh, any demographic for this type of knowledge or education? Yeah. Has there been a shift in any way in, in the greater community uh, yeah. in America as a whole looking for this type of um, yes. solution? No, no doubt, no doubt. There is, has been a, a big shift, especially the past five years. More and more younger people are coming towards Islamic learning. They're seeing the spiritual value in Islamic learning. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe is this generation also, that this generation is kind of very audacious, uh, um, outspoken in many ways. Uh, they're not shy to say who they are. Mm -hmm. So now the, the, this generation of Muslim youth, they're not shy to say they're Muslim. Uh, uh, cuts the other way too. If God forbid they're gay, they won't be shy to say they're gay. <laughs> mm, <yeah. laughs> cuts both ways. Right. But we're taking advantage of this wave of, uh, of the where young minds. Yeah. yeah, the, young the idea, minds. like you said, wear your identity, wear it proud. Yeah. Kind of thing. So yeah. that that is how mm. we, we have been able to. And other schools in the area, they kind of enjoy the same experience that we get. We are receiving so many requests to learn Islam and study Islam properly. The whole nine yards. Yeah. So, and we don't rely just on the local community. Forty percent of our students are from outside. I see. Okay, but they they move to the Chicago. They move area. here. Yeah. Uh, is there a on campus living concept? No, we don't have that yet. Uh, we wanted them to have the uh, full American experience. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, no. Which includes a commute. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, which includes finding a space oh, to live, yeah, uh, cooking, yeah, paying right. your bills. Yeah, no sad. mama, no papa. We only we start at 18, so the parents cannot interfere mm. legally. Right. If you start at 17 or 16, the parents can still legally ask you questions. <laughs> so that's by design. Right. That we wanted them to experience their lives the way they should. But obviously, we supervise. Huh? Mm. And alhamdulillah, they, they, they do have some issues with housing, uh, but they, they manage. Okay. Yeah. They is, do manage. Is the eventual goal that uh, uh, you'll sunset this campus and move entirely into the new one, or still keep this campus for perhaps admin or some of the. No, stuff? this campus will be vibrant. Okay. E evening classes will be here, weekend classes will be here, the Sunday stuff seer, uh -huh. at least for the foreseeable future, will be here. Okay. So we, we have a, 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 a utility for this space. We're not, we're not leaving here. Right. And plus, yeah. all the uh, teachers' uh, offices are here, and most of them live around here. So it'd right. be useful for them to be here in the evening, on the weekends. Right. As the school has taken on full-time students, it sounds like you haven't forgotten the wider community that's just looking for you know, a little dose of spirituality. Yeah. Or, yes, yes. Right? That's why we yeah. kept the weekend... Yeah. We, we are planning to have a, a national uh, kind of Dara Qasim program where you don't need to register. It'll be one-off lectures oh. from other ulama. Just, as you said, give them a taste of some academic, you know, fodder for the week. Mm. So that's coming, inshallah, soon. Inshallah. But we, we do have uh, many plans and many ideas, which hopefully will come to fruition very soon. Inshallah. Right. Off air, we, you know, we were talking about accreditation. The process is underway, inshallah, God willing, maybe in the next year or two, that'll yeah, yes, eventually inshallah. happen. Yeah. You do have uh, students who are matriculating to, through the program. Where do they go on to study, or where have some of the graduates? Yeah, the, some of them, they, we, we employ them. Okay. In other chapters, and sometimes we employ them for admin. I see. Uh, if they go back home, some of them already have bachelor's degrees and some of them are already in a profession that we have right. you know, a couple of doctors who are studying here. Mm. But to be clear, is the degree a bachelor's degree? In no. either now, is that the goal? The no, no, no. Our degree will be a master's okay. in Islamic law, Islamic theology. Master's, okay. Yeah, not, not a bachelor. We're not doing bachelor's yet. Okay. okay. Yeah. So the focus is only going to be graduate students. Yeah. And the idea is for them to be able to graduate, go on to careers in the community or wherever else they yeah, want to do. Yeah, with a master's, you can yeah, basically right. find a job very quickly. Okay, so, okay. So. And that's the goal. That's the goal. Uh, or maybe some of them will want to come back here and study and more or be a teacher. We, we right. do have graduates who are teachers here on main campus. That's right. Yeah. So, so the idea of a seminary that is producing graduates um, 
and discipline is the sort of traditional normative approach to Islamic learning, whereas the modality of education, though, is Western. Obviously, the discipline and the approach is traditional Islamic normative. Yeah, Islamic so we normative. run and operate as a college, there you go. but we teach as a madrasa. I like that. Okay, mm -hmm. got it. And so that's that would be the elevator pitch or the Darul Qasim in a, in a nutshell, yeah. exactly what you just said. Yeah. So the future goal, again, is to fully become a not only a graduate facility, but also an undergraduate one. Hopefully, but okay. we're aiming for the PhD level. And I see. We, we have certain departments, like departments of theology, of, yeah. of law, and um, hadith, and Quran, and Qiraat, okay. and Arabic. So okay. those departments, hopefully, we want them to in evolve into individual colleges. Okay. Separate. Understood. Okay. Yeah. And so will you still continue to offer opportunities for students who are, you know, can't do it part <coughs> or can only do it part time? Yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah. And that'll continue to happen. Oh, yeah, definitely. Okay. So the original vision of, uh, you know, again, yeah. young professionals being able to come and study can, stu you know, well, can still continue. It's kind of natural kind of progress. I see. What I envision. Naturally, this is going to happen. Mm -hmm. Spe speaking of vision, you know, 20 years ago, you had a vision, and we here we are today, mashallah. And a vision is always future facing. So, what's the vision to the, be a, the, you know, for the future vision? Say to be a, yeah, to be a university, right? Okay, an Islamic university. Inshallah. Would it be open to people of yes other faiths? Yes, definitely. And that's what a university is. <laughs> and so they would come and do a what a graduate degree in Islamic theology. Well, we'll force them to become Muslim. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, we'll charge them jizya. <laughs> you heard it here, folks. No, I'm joking. I'm joking. And then um, uh, we'll yeah. force them to change yeah. their attire. Yeah. Uh, come in burqas. Name, <laughs> the name, of course, all that, right? <laughs> no, we'll be open as much as we can be, inshallah, okay. yeah. without changing the, the, the culture. Right. But we do want them to be here okay. and learn Islam from us rather than other places. You mm -hmm. know? Yeah. So they get the authentic Islam. Them. That's, beautiful. Yeah. That's beautiful. If I could, um, as we begin to conclude then, broaden the scope just a little bit, what in your estimation, Sheikh Amin, because again, I, I would feel remiss if we didn't explore at least some of this while we have you here, are some of the major challenges for the Muslim community in America, and are some of the significant challenges that the Muslim community faces right now, today? Because uh, Yeah, I mean, that's a kind of loaded question. And I apologize for that. MashaAllah. If you look at the macro, yes, I think uh, security factor for Muslims in this country. Um, you know, who do you vote for? Who do you hope comes in and governs us? Yeah. That's a major concern. Okay, I say we we can't be aloof from that reality because you know. Which one do you choose? I mean, uh, whether you choose Republican or Democrat, it doesn't matter to you as a Muslim. You're still compromised. Right yeah. after having. Cho chosen one yeah. path or the other and kind of gone all in on those yeah. ideologies, right? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the party line, you can't really toe the party line because uh, invariably most of their values, uh, they don't jive with us. Correct. So it's very difficult to be loyal to any party, political party, which makes it very confusing for the Muslim to say, which way do I go? Now, I'm here, right. I, I have a passport, I'm a citizen, I was born here, there you go. but what's my future here in terms yeah. of national security? And mm -hmm. so, so I think yeah. that's a tension that people don't realize they have. They don't actually believe it. They believe that everything's fine and dandy. Yeah. Until, God forbid, Trump says, let's have a Muslim ban, you know. <laughs> then suddenly. <laughs> then they kind of wake up, hey, wait a minute, there's, there's something about being Muslim in this country. Right. Uh, that is, you know, alien to the American mind. So, but, That's very so what we have to do, we have to prove ourselves that uh, we, we, we are, um, uh, you know, a, a, a demographic that has to be trusted and that adds value to, you know, the country and yeah. not just the economy, but also some of the values and uh, we can be part of the culture and adding value to the culture. And so, so there, there has to be a proactive approach by the Muslim to, you know, see this country as their home. Sure. So I think that's one of the biggest challenges at the macro level. Okay. Mm -hmm. At the micro level, again, there are just so many of them. Mm -hmm. uh, one is obviously 
getting permission and permits to build what you want to build and make sure your Mossad institutions are secure and safe, you know, and make sure there's no racial tension, there's no um, bullying, and, and there's no inter institutional racism. Mm -hmm. So we have to fight that. And, uh, and it is at the micro level that most people would want to side with the Democrats. <laughs> for better or worse, I don't know which way is the best. But uh, I think those, those kind of, the most important thing is to secure security. Yeah. Now, how do we do that on the ground? That, that requires a town hall meeting, I think, and people who are invested in the country should come to terms with this reality that is not always, uh, you know, fine and dandy. Mm. There's a lot of work that we need to do intellectually and, uh, you know, even in terms of writing white papers or writing books and articles and uh, become part of a syndicate uh, yeah. that can write and because everybody reads here on the whole. People that, do read. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, you know, to broaden the scope of, of for example, positions that Darul Qasim or faculty at Darul Qasim have taken vis-a-vis -vis issues and publish that. Mm -hmm. So, for example, like the fatwa during the pandemic around vaccines, um, you know, that certainly was in circulation. Um, I think addressing broader issues beyond yeah. just uh, bioethics and mm -hmm. even maybe, you know, delving into that political question yeah. of, you know, living in a, in a two-party state or a two-party system, excuse me, and how do you negotiate that? Um, so, yeah, so I, I think that would be something that I think would, uh, you know, certainly something that yeah, would no, be definitely welcomed yeah. from. We have to produce that level of scholarship. And That's right. They were, they're grounded in some of the usul of sharia, so they're not shooting from the hip. Exactly. Yeah. And I think there's too much of that going on. Yeah. yeah. But, uh, there's too much of that. Uh, one thing that I uh, heard from you, I would, I would love to hear some just additional uh, comments or explanation or on your thoughts, is you express some optimism about the youth's confidence in their Muslim identity. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to hear you just to explain a little more or, or share your thoughts on the youth and where they're headed. Do you have optimism? Uh, what are your concerns? Hmm. Well, the, um, the well, concerns are, are, are many, but there's a lot of hope, I think, in, okay. in the younger. How do parents, you know, harness that, though? Hmm. Like, I agree that perhaps young people have the sort of raw ingredients mm -hmm. of what you're describing. Mm -hmm. But then how do, say, we as parents, Omar and I are both fathers, instill or, or harness that potential in the child? Well, I think um, um, you have to understand the obstacles in parenting. And uh, one obstacle is... Um, you know, the, the overarching kind of mistrust of the parents in their children. I don't know whether it's inherent in our culture, but, you know, I just get the feeling the parents simply do not trust their kids, <laughs> for better or worse. Um, um, and that obviously lowers their self-esteem. Yeah. I'm here, I'm 18 years old, I'm capable of voting, I'm capable of doing everything, but here my, my parents simply won't let me do what the heck I want to do. So, uh, so when you hear that parents are forcing their kids to become doctors when they don't want to be doctors, uh, that's very detrimental. Mm. You're not American. I mean, in, in, the, in the American psyche, you do what the heck you want to do after 18. Who cares? Uh, fend yeah. for yourself. No, that's extreme. Of course. But it makes you mukallaf. Mm. It makes you responsible for that's your right. own life, which is where we failed. You're right. We haven't managed to secure you know, the confidence of our children in being able to handle life themselves. Independently. Yeah. Yeah. That's where the challenge is, I think, in parenting. Mm. If you can trust your child, I mean, what the heck? You guys came from India, Pakistan, the Arab world, and you were 18, 19, and you did everything you wanted to do. Mm -hmm. And now you're preaching Islam and say, no, no, we can't give you freedom. You're in the land of freedom, so you don't want to give freedom. That, that is because there's an insecurity, there's a lack of trust in, you know, believing that your child can actually do something at 18. Mm. No, I'm not saying that you don't supervise them, that you don't advise them, you don't monitor them. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying 
that if the children see just a little bit of trust in them from their parents and they, 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 they don't become helicopter parents and they don't choose their careers for them, which I think is disgusting. Right. How do you choose a career for somebody who is independent? He has his own autonomy, he has his own mind, he should be able to choose his career in a place where careers are celebrated at least, instead of just um, pushing them down one road. Do you see that though, because I almost feel like what you're describing is more, was more relevant or prevalent, I should say, in, in our parents, so, so like my parents' generation. So, yeah. Whereas Gen X isn't so much like that about with, with their children, or you still see I it? still see that. Got it. Very much so. Interesting. It's still very traditional. Uh -huh. Yeah, uh -huh. I mean, I come across young uh, high schoolers who tell their parents that I want to be an alim. Okay. And the parents say, no, never. <laughs> What's that? No. With respect, if there was if there was an American family, the American parent will say, "Go ahead, mm. do what you want to do, but do it well." Mm. Now that insecurity that uh, somehow being an alim means you won't be able to live and find food or clothing or shelter—I mean, that's ridiculous. Mm. What about on the flip side? The there's the hey, um, I know what's best for you from. Uh, career or what have you point of view what about that fear of uh, the fear of the outside world when it comes to their iman for example that's always a concern and that should be a concern but um, it doesn't matter which field you go to that concern should always be there are you not concerned when you send your daughter to college that she's not going to be exposed to all the american elements of course I mean, that, and that's kind of what I'm referring to. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. Yeah, of course you are. Of course you are. Yeah. Then why, why do you say then push them to go to college despite the fear? Because of the worldly benefits. Uh, <laughs> or because uh, somehow you believe what that system has to offer is far yeah. more superior than what we have to offer, which is again a tragedy. So, so there has to be some, some trust. I'm not saying that you, you mustn't advise them. You can advise them that, look, this, this is okay, but remember, at the end of the day, you may not be able to earn as much as them, which is ridiculous, and that's not true at all. And uh, We did a survey, the uh, IBHE, Illinois Board of Higher Education, when we applied for license. That's right. They asked this question, where will your graduates find jobs? Hmm. Valid question. Yeah, of course. And the purpose was to show us that can we c contribute to the economy of Illinois? Because when we give you a license and you guys don't help the economy of Illinois, that's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we did some research, mashallah, and we found to our surprise that there were 35, 40 plus jobs available right now in the USA and also in Illinois for a master's in Islamic law. Really? Entry level. That's impressive. And they started 70K plus. That's we impressive. gave them this sheet and they're very happy. Oh, wonderful. You're going to now help the Illinois economy grow. Of course. And it is perhaps one of the key reasons why they gave us the license. So you will not be a burden on the state. You will contribute. So I think that's a myth. It's just that we don't know. Mm. Yeah, we That's simply right. don't know enough to make that uh, assessment. So, yeah, shooting from the hips. <laughs> and I think it goes back to something you know you mentioned earlier, which is a lack of confidence yeah. in the ability that we don't have to be an insular community yeah. only. As we conclude, then I want to ask you one more question. We've talked a lot about young people, and so I want to continue in that vein. I think one of the challenges that I've seen, uh, I know certainly in my own children, others who that uh, belong to my generation and are raising kids in America, which is that, by and large, these children grow up and live in privilege. Pretty much everything they need is provided to them. They live in comfort, certainly safety, security, let alone a roof over their heads and food to eat and a, you know sleep with a belly full. And so, but growing up in that privilege, I think the challenge that I've confronted is inculcating in that type of a child who has basically been given everything he or she needs, even beyond that, feels entitled to it. 
uh, creating in them or nurturing in them a theology where they still see the value and the importance in connecting and, and, and having a relationship and a dependence on God. Independence. How, I do, think, you, is how do you tell? Sorry? I think you nailed it when you say yeah. not just relationship, dependence. Dependence on God. Yeah. Like, I need a God. A God isn't just a nicety, or I don't just, you know, turn to God out of, like, obligation alone. But of course, that that's the starting point. But there's a there's a thirst and a desire to connect with Allah, to connect with God. Yeah. Have you thought about that? And, yeah, and, and I... Kind of million dollar question. <laughs> I've asked one open ended and, question and a million and dollar it's a, question. And just so, to just yeah. rear, I mean, yeah. I, I think yeah. it's a good good question, Perez, because it's accelerating by the month, by the year, because the entire economy now mm -hmm. is built on the idea of just making one app to make something just a little remove friction they say from consumerism it's just so so now i can for example click a button have a meal delivered to my to my door i can i i, forgot, I didn't have a chance to go to the store i can just pay 2.99 extra and, and have it fast mm. delivered by tonight mm. right so there's this there's this no, you there's mean, no delayed gratification. It's immediate gratification. Oh, it's immediate, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I so thought you were also alluding to the fact that uh, gone are the days where young people or someone who had, you know hasn't pursued a four-year degree at minimum or mm. even uh, or or at at minimum a trade school mm -hmm. can support themselves because I can be an influencer, right. I can be a YouTube star, yeah. and make millions. Now, of course, yeah. those are outliers. I mean, you can talk statistics all day, though, quick, all, the, all day, though, yeah. to children. Yeah. So they don't get that either. You're so, talking about they see, they see no, this. What, the kids are seeing others' instant gratification. Instant gratification. No, instant, instant reward. reward. Instant reward. Instant yeah. reward. Instant reward. Instant gratification, but also shortcuts you know, with very little strife. Yeah with very uh, little discomfort. Uh -huh. Going back to the question that I asked, which is how do you inculcate in, in them a dependence mm -hmm. on God, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, so, so there's, um, if you read the stories of all the prophets in the Quran, the, they were sent to people who were privileged. So, that's very that true. That's the challenge. Right? I mean, you talk about Firaun. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> and Musa Ali Salam going there to tell him, you know, you're not doing something right here. So it's, mm. it's, that's always the big challenge, mm. which is the challenge we face, uh, yeah. you know, with the ulama uh, trying to, you know, reform the community's attitude and uh, all of this. But it is kind of slowly and slowly, If I believe if we inculcate the love of learning Islam, then I think some of those, um, you know, anomalies will go away slowly. I think but it's, it's about love, creating love for, you know, who Allah is, who the mm -hmm. Rasul is, but you, you can't do that without giving them knowledge of Allah and the Rasul and the Quran. And, True. Uh, so, so many students come here for the one-year program. Mm -hmm. And they're infatuated with the level of knowledge that Islam offers. Because the myth in their minds is that Islam doesn't offer anything. Not Even they, those who come here? Yeah, yeah, they come in with that. Because you would think that they would come at least with a kernel of, you know, desire. They there. do have the desire, but their, their understanding is, is very limited. They, they, they still don't believe Islam is a solution to anything. Mm. But when they come and actually learn the sophistication that Islam offers in intellectual discourse, then they're mesmerized. So they, this doesn't happen in universities. So there's no mm. discourse on, you know, the realities of the universe. There's no, you know, understanding of who God is. And I think so. Rather than say indoctrination, we can say education. Yeah, absolutely. That's... Yeah, it's all education that yeah. once somebody is now you know, hooked on, you know, loving Islamic knowledge. That creates itself a dynamic in the mind of the person that if nothing else, I'm dependent on learning. Mm -hmm. I'm dependent on knowledge. Mm -hmm. So you talk about dependency, finding, you know, a hook for dependency, albeit a good one. Hmm? Inshallah, that's one of the goals of Dara Qasim. And it's not the only right. hook, but it could be one of many mm. that we can do. The other is, obviously, if you find a, 
uh, a good sheikh uh, who can, uh, you know, attach you to the other world and uh, give you a sense of, you know, this world is not all. That's right, the vastness of. Yeah, and you go into another domain, another dimension of your own existence, then and that's also a big hook. So, so this generation, you see that the, the uh, most people don't want to live with their parents anymore. You see San Francisco. Mm -hmm. There, some of the middle class people who just refuse to enjoy the benefits of their parents. Yeah, not the most Islamic thing to do, but that idea is there that uh, this world is not enough. It's simply not enough. Now, I'm not sure they'll ever catch on with the you know privileged Muslim kid, but uh, no, I think. Hmm? No, I think that's it's a fascinating point, and and as you're talk, uh, sort of shared your ideas, you know, I I couldn't help but sort of think and respond in my own ways, and and the common thread that I'm seeing or or hearing in what you're what you're saying, is this idea that in order for them to appreciate the sophistication of Islam, the sophistication of our tradition, the the depth and profundity of what Islam offers, that comes through education. Yes. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I never thought of it that way, quite yeah. in those exact or in those exact terms, because of, you know you pay lip service to the idea that well, of course, you know they have to learn or they have to be educated. Yeah. But mm -hmm. you don't realize that what that education alone, mm -hmm. the, what it opens in yeah. the mind of the student or the person who yeah, gets it, that it, aha moment, that epiphany. Yeah, I, I think if you can create an idea of status that is yes. uh, commensurate with your knowledge. Yes then you will be the elite, basically. The mm. thing is status, social status. In the Middle Ages, when we were, you know, the best civilization on the planet, right. we had the elite who had the status of being knowledgeable. And all of us, Imam Ghazali says that if you're, you know, an alim in my time, you'll get a job with the, uh, you know, the government immediately. Right. So there's a social status there. So I think if we mm. raise the bar for, uh, you know, the social status with knowledge that uh, they're seen as the elite. Mm. And that's how we survive with the Ottomans and the Mughals. Mm. Because most of their employees were ulama. <coughs> right? That's right. And then obviously that that devil came in and destroyed all that. So now we have to pick up the pieces and start, uh, you know, giving people, you know, confidence that in the eyes of Allah and the Rasul, I have the highest status. So status, and, that. and then if society around those people can say, yeah, he, he he's he's already respected because of who he is and what he knows, then that will make a change, it will make a difference. Yes. I think if you start competing with the doctors, lawyers, engineers and whoever, mm -hmm. and say, no, at the table we also have an alim and he's just as good as we are, like in this conference in ethics. Okay. Well, alhamdulillah, without blowing my own trumpet, I was the referee, basically, without being the referee. Because they all said, no, let's ask the sheikh. Let's defer to yeah. sheikh. I mean, exactly. So yeah. I mean, but you have to develop that level of scholarship. Right. Uh, you can't just make it a slogan. Mm. Uh, the proof's in the pudding. The people have to trust you and That's trust right. your verdict and trust your opinion right. and that you're actually qualified to do what you're doing, inshallah. So I think there's a bit of both. I think sure. the all of our industry need to really um, kind of, uh, you know, increase their performance and the other Muslims need to realize the importance of Islamic knowledge because mm. Islamic knowledge is useful in the world also. There, there has to be, I think, a little bit of, um, what do we call it, giving uh, a, a kind of financial backing to the ulama industry, okay, where you have to make it commercially viable. As well. Yeah, agreed. Thank you so much, Sheikh Amin. I don't want to take many more of your time. As we conclude then, where can our listeners learn more about Darul Qasim, uh, learn more about you and the work in, in any way that they choose to support the work that they that you're doing and uh, perhaps participate. Yeah, I think that's a, a very good conclusion. I said they should come here, visit both campuses, sit down, talk with the ulama, talk with the students, uh, look at the website, see what kind of programs we offer. We do have a substantial amount of uh, knowledge there on the website, and they can access that through recordings, the sending to Seer, uh, then participating, especially financially, yeah. that y y you want to be 
you know, part owner of this project. Yeah, so that's why it comes that you must feel invested in this mm -hmm. project. I um, would want to point out that as someone who's consumed endless hours of content from your website, uh, not all of it is behind a paywall. But, uh, you know, you can access a lot of information that's there, access a lot of content, uh, hours of content that is available free, and then but there's a lot, there's a substantial amount of the really good stuff yeah. that's behind the paywall. So yeah. you can do so by becoming a donor and by supporting yeah, what exactly. Dara Qasim is doing. Uh, inshallah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We're not here to necessarily make money, but we right. need money to make things happen. It's kind of catch-22. <laughs> Correct. Correct. You can't do anything without money, especially in this country. So yeah. that's our pitch, that for the, for the donors, they, they yeah. must see themselves as investors mm -hmm. more than if not in this world at least the world hereafter so being sadqa jariya basically that's right so please uh, as as you leave uh, make dua for that that our little project here succeeds I mean, Allah give you we've been success uh, doing it for 10 years uh, but yeah you know whatever yeah i think you'll hit your critical mass very soon uh, as soon as you raise a million dollars for Dara Qasim, you'll be on the map. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we should definitely pursue that. Well, um, thank you so much, Sheikh Amin. No, it's uh, my pleasure, and hopefully you guys will be very successful. Thank Inshallah, you. Inshallah, give you barakah. Inshallah, I mean, As always, listeners, thank you so much for listening. If you have questions, comments, please send it to diffusecongruence at gmail.com. If you want to become a supporter of the show, become a patron of the show, you can go to patreon.com slash diffusecongruence. Every little bit helps, to tell you the truth. These trips that Omar and I take uh, when we hit the road, they are primarily out of pocket. But if we're able to get and sustain a critical mass to what Sheikh Amin just said, a critical mass of patrons, we can certainly be able to underwrite some of the cost of that and be able to hit more cities and more places and interview more people that aren't local only to the Bay Area. So please do consider becoming a patron. So thank you as always for listening. And the next episode, probably our next stop on this wonderful trip to Chicago. So thank you as always for listening. Join us next time. Diffuse congruence.